carry you live stream. Carry you live stream. Now, brothers and sisters, um, before I start, the first hymn is 171. You can look that up now. Right. Good. Ben. Good evening to you all. Good. I hope you all are warm enough once you're inside. So we all are no, thankfully gathered still, and um, although all the other stories round about might be a little bit like what's happening in Victoria, but here we are, we are still locked out of all that. So we do welcome Ah, you're there. Welcome, how are you? <laughs> anyway, so tonight we are uh, being led in a uh, further study of Revelation, Revelation 
chapter 12 by one our brother Dan Jolly. And he has, as usual, a very intriguing title for his study. So we're going to find out what it means to be a serpent, a child, uh, a woman, a serpent, a child, and but it's all different. So we'll open our meeting with him in prayer, and our opening him is 171. Approach thy throne, glorious, almighty creator, father of us, thy children, in thy son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We come together as the body of thy son in this small part of thy vineyard. A group of people who have been destined by thee, be renewed in mind and spirit, that we may take up the government of this earth to lead the nations to thee to also execute the judgments written that that people which will be left of all nations we will know that they will hearken to thy word those great and amazing privileges thou hast invited us to for we do groan within ourselves when we see the wickedness we see the ignorance and darkness which covers the people. We live in the end days and we see the, the speed in which things change around about us, acknowledging in all this that our time is short. We know that things still have to happen. And we might well see things we, might, we would have expected not to see. For thou art not willing that any of, should, of us should perish and in thy patience that endures with us in long-suffering patience, that all we all might turn our focus on thee and learn to fully trust in thy mighty hand of which we have sung in our hymn. So tonight as we continue our study, we realize these are the words of thine son to us, his brethren and sisters that we might be warned in every age, as we are warned still in this age by his words. But looking back, we see his hands in the lives of thy children, for he died for them and has one desire, that we might follow him in the way which leads to life, to glory and joy. Father, for all these things, we do give thee our praise and thanks and pray that I will be accepting of that thing. 
works in thy son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we will then take up our reading, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule over rule all nations with a rod of iron, and their child was called up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God that she should feed her there thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was that place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of, our, of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of, out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of his seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's my pleasure to invite Dan. Thanks for that, Uncle Axel, and good evening, everybody. It's really good to see you all here. All right, I just have to get set up the usual technical dramas and we'll be off. So, uh, yes, a fun title again. Um, I'm not going to go into the title in any great detail, but as you go through, you'll notice 
uh, in this story, there are elements that come from another very famous story. There's, there's a woman, there's a snake, there's a child, there's the earth. Adam made from the earth, earthy. Uh, but it's a very, very different story. Yes, it's a creation story of sorts, um, but it's, it's a different tale here because the child that comes forth is not one that's going to be destined eventually to glory and to the forgiveness of the father, but one that is destined for condemnation and uh, destruction in the pit of fire. Enough of that. What are we going to do tonight? So tonight, as par normal, we're going to do a quick recap on our last class. It's been a month since we considered Revelation chapter 11. And then we're going to dive straight into Revelation 12. And tonight we're going to flip what we did in previous classes. Rather than trying to explain the symbols and then lay the history over the top, this time we're going to talk about the history and then try and lay the symbols over the top. And you can tell me whether that's better or worse afterwards. And somewhere along the line, we are going to have to do an extra class. And by extra class, I mean a class that is not a chapter. And the reason for that is I really think we need to unravel the beasts. There's all these beasts and dragons, and we need to line them up for ourselves and work out which one is where and who and what. And as we get into our next chapter, chapter 13, that's going to become important. So um, I suspect we'll choose at the end of this class to do chapter 13, but I'm hoping after that we might choose to do a night on beasts because I think we're going to need it. Okay, so our last class, you'll remember our last class had two timelines in it, didn't it? Uh, we were looking at the timeline of the treading down of those within the temple, those without the, the, the sort of non-believers, who cares about them? They weren't trodden down, but those within are trodden down for a period of 42 months. And then we're told about two witnesses who were two olive trees, who were two lampstands, who were two candles, who were two this, that, and the other thing. And, and they go on witnessing for, well, not 42 months, but exactly the same amount of time, 1,260 days or years. And we saw what was being described here as two different periods of persecution for, for different groups within what might be broadly described as the Christian community. We saw that the witnessing of those witnesses would end at a certain point in time. There, was, there were two witnesses, and, and I suggested to you we might describe them as one being a sort of state-focused witness and one being a religious-focused witness. One being a witness that was, if you like, anti-pagan and anti-Catholic, and other, another being a witness that was anti the power of the Catholic state. But eventually their testimony ran out and the strange beast emerges. Let's have a look at that because that's really important to us over the next couple of nights. Verse 7 of chapter 11. When they shall have finished their testimony, it comes up in our chapter tonight, the beast, we haven't heard of a beast before here in Revelation, this is the first time, the beast that ascends out of not the bottomless pit, remember we've said a couple of times that word pit is not there, is the bottomless, out of the abyss, out of the deep blue sea, if you like, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's an important thing to Hold that verse in your memory and witnesses. And I'm could I just give me a glass of water, please. I know I'm going to need it at some point this evening. But miraculously, despite the beasts killing them and their corpses lying in the street for three and a half days, up they pop like jack in the boxes. And we saw that the events of the French Revolution and and the events immediately before that raised, if you like, the power of those witnessing communities who were anti-Catholic and the anti-Catholic state. And so this is our timeline from, or should I say, our dual timelines from Revelation chapter 11. One was the timeline of the prophecy of the two witnesses going from, we said, the Battle of Milvian Bridge in which Constantine gained power all of the way through the St. Bartholomew Day's massacre. And the other went from the trampling of the holy city, the declaration of Justinian, in which he effectively declared um, uh, Catholic principles to be all that we believe and, and hold dear, all of the way through to the reign of terror 
uh, and really the fall of, of Catholic dogma as an all-powerful thing in the state. So, clear as mud? Everyone's nodding, saying, yes, that's, that's as, as ambiguous and confusing as it was last time. So if it was ambiguous and confusing last time, please come and talk to me at some other time. I'm very happy to try and uh, add in the bits that I've missed in explaining that to you tonight. So our timeline for this evening is very, very similar. In fact, it's running over almost exactly the same time period. It's just... Uh, beginning a little bit earlier, we're actually beginning within a couple of years of the death of Jesus Christ, and we will see why by and by. So this prophecy in Revelation chapter 12 begins earlier, but it's going to run through almost exactly the same period as the witnessing of the two witnesses. And we'll go through the details of these in a minute. But I just for the moment want you to notice the similarities in terms of the time period to our last chart. We are looking at almost identical periods of time and I will show you why in a moment. We will come back to this timeline right at the end and hopefully by then you'll go, oh yeah, now it makes sense. It, it's not quite so confusing as it was. So let's start with the history. What we want to do tonight is really look at the history of the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And yes, that is Milvian Bridge. It was restored, if I remember correctly, in the 1400s. But that is the very Milvian Bridge of the famous battle we're going to talk about. A bridge that, that runs across the Tiber into the ancient city of Rome. So we're going to lead into the story of this battle. You remember uh, that uh, during the period of the seals, um, way back in Revelation chapter 6, there, there was a period of peace. Uh, that there was a very sort of, um, uh, one of the seals, pardon me, uh, was, was a, a white horse, and that, that was a period of peace. And then we went through a period of, of, of bloodshed with a red horse. Um, and, and then there was, there was a black horse. And finally, there was the chlorine death colored horse. And this chlorine death colored horse described a period of time of great destruction, of turmoil, of violence, of uncertainty in the pagan Roman Empire in the late 200s, sort of 270 onwards. Many emperors came and went, came and went. people were not safe in their own houses. It was an absolutely terrible time. Uh, and it was called the crises of the third century. It's a well-known period. And, and towards the end of this period, Domitian came to power. Domitian, uh, sorry, Diocletian came to power. Diocletian was one of the Caesars. And he was the Caesar over all of Rome, all of the Roman Empire. And he wanted a way to stabilize his kingdom, stop this constant churn of emperors, um, one emperor would kill another and there was no he wanted a stable empire and so what he did is he set up what was called the tetrarchy and and the map on the behind me that you can see there is the way the tetrarchy was laid out he fundamentally broke the roman empire into four chunks and he gave one chunk to each of his favored men and there were Four Caesars in the Roman Empire at that point in time. And if you like, the, the Caesar of Caesars, the, the top dogs in their region. And then the others, the other two, the lower two, were intended to be the spare for the air. You know, if one of the Caesars dies, one of the Augustus dies, the other one steps up. And so we'd have a succession plan. And the reason for having, so we've got two on each side of the empire. That's so we've got a succession plan. If one dies, there's another one already appointed. We know who it's going to be. But secondly, because the empire was so vast, it was impossible to manage it from one capital. They tried to manage it from Rome, but Rome was miles away from the epicenter of the, the empire. And so what this man Diocletian did is he split it up and he created Tetrarchy. And that picture of four men cuddling is, is a statue of 
of the Tetrarchy, the four Caesars holding the empire together. And so there was meant to be this plan of succession. And so uh, at the time where our story begins, at the end of the crises of the third century, when Diocletian stabilizes everything, we've got Maximian in the West and Diocletian in the East. And under them, we have Constantius Chlorus in the far West and Galerius uh, in the Middle East. Now, Constantius Chlorus is going to be our hero of tonight's dad, Constantine's dad. And uh, he, he actually ruled from Germany, but Constantius Chlorus had to head across Britain because the British, as they always are, were being a pain in the neck. And in fact, more particularly, the Scots were being a pain in the neck. And so um, Constantius Chlorus was up above Hadrian's Wall fighting against the Picts and the Scots. Um, and his son, Constantine, came to visit and fought in some battles with him. And sadly, while this was happening, Constantius Chlorus, Constantius the Pale, got sick and died. And that was a problem because the top dog in the whole empire, Diocletian, was the one who declared who would be the next Caesar. And uh, because Constantius Chlorus had, de had died rather than Maximian, there wasn't sort of, it wasn't this sort of nice step up through the line, if you can see what I mean. It wasn't Constantius Chlorus getting promoted to, to Doc Dog on the West. He didn't get to put someone in, in the bottom. Um, uh, it was expected that Diocletian would decide who is going to be the next Caesar. And in fact, by this point, it isn't even Diocletian. Diocletian is retired, he's in his estates, and it's Galerius. Galerius hated Constantine. Not good friends at all. And so he snubbed Constantine and said, well, we're not going to make Constantine the next in line. Uh, and he was busy planning to work out who else he was going to give the purple ermine robe of Emperor II when the soldiers in Britain around Constantine made a decision for themselves. They said, we've fought with this guy. We know his dad. We trust him. We're going to make him Caesar in the West. And Galerius kind of found out about this, uh, mainly because Constantine sent him a letter saying, hey, look, just thought you should know I've just been declared Caesar. And he kind of said, well, okay, I'm going to have to just live with this. And he agreed with the fact that Constantine should be Caesar in the West, in the far West. Now, what you can see behind me, the major um, cathedral in York, uh, York in the United Kingdom of all places, um, which back then was no known as Ibarakim. And if you go to York, there is actually an Ibarakim street even still. Um, uh, and there at York, the soldiers declared him to be emperor. Okay, so now Caesar is emperor. Uh, uh, sorry, Constantine is emperor. And Galerius in the far east needs to redo his pecking order. So he does. He, he appoints Caesar to be the top dog, uh, Severus to be the top dog, Constantine to be the number two. Um, and he also appoints another man in, in the east as well, uh, Maximinus. So we've got a new set of four Caesars. Well, the problem was this guy here. Now, I don't know what you think about that particular face, but he just looks like someone who was bullied at primary school to me. Um, his name is um, Maxentius. No, not Maximinus, Maxentius. And he, he was in the area of Italy. Now, the problem was, if we, if we flick back here, you'll see Maximian was the top dog. Well, Maxentius just happens to be Maximian's son. And he thought, well, since Constantine got the gig as an emperor, well, I should have too. But unfortunately, the difference was that Maxentius had never fought in the army. He had no popular support. It wasn't really a starter. Unfortunately, he made it a starter. He had money. He had some degree of influence in the area. And so he declared himself to be an emperor which then meant there was a problem because the Tetrarchy had five emperors. And Galerius had not agreed to this. Constantine started marching across his part of the Western Roman Empire, heading towards Mac Mac 
Maxentius. And this is where our story really gets interesting because Constantine was a seasoned warrior. Maxentius had money and influence. Maxentius was in Rome, a very, very defensible city. Constantine wasn't. And so Constantine is coming towards Rome and he's got less men, less power than Maxentius. Uh, and he, he, he needs to win this war against Maxentius, who Galerius has said, I don't want to be Caesar anymore. You've got to knock him off. And this is where the Battle of Milvian Bridge comes in. Because uh, Constantine gets all the way across to Rome in order to take out Maxentius, uh, and Maxentius decides, no, I'm just going to camp in Rome. I'm not going to come out and fight. Uh, but then Maxentius, who's a real pagan, reads what's called the Sibylline Chronicles. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of this story, but the Sibylline Chronicles were what looks like a series of novels that the Romans just happened to have picked up in some secondhand bookstore, but they believe they were real. And the sentences in the Sibylline Chronicles could be read to answer any problem. So far as so, and this is not a joke, at various times when there were plagues, they'd read the Sibylline Chronicles and the Sibylline Chronicles would say things like, you need to bury... Um, alive, two Gauls and a pygmy. I'm not joking. And so they would do that and think that would fix the plague. This is the sort of thing you'd get from the Sibylline Chronicles. And so Maxentius, believing the Sibylline Chronicles, read them and they said to him, uh, the emperor of Rome will be destroyed. And he thought to himself, well, ha, I know who the emperor of Rome is here. And out he went. Now, Constantine, he basically had his soldiers way backed off. They were in a forest. And Maxentius came out. And to come out, Maxentius had to come across the Milvian Bridge. And in addition, Maxentius had built some pontoon bridges across to help his soldiers get across the River Tiber. Now, anyone who's been a warrior, I don't know how many of you have been warriors, will know that when your soldiers are in a long thin line on a bridge, they're very, it's not a good place for your soldiers to be. Uh, and that was exactly the point where Constantine, once they're all on the bridge, Constantine said, now it's my time to come out and whip you guys. And he did. He took them on on the bridge, firing arrows at all these soldiers on the Milvian Bridge, very exposed bridge, and defeated them. Poor old Maxentius fell off the bridge, crashed his head on one of the pontoons had built, built and drowned in the river and was, was basically pulled out of the river dead sometime later on which of course misses the really interesting part about this story, which is the story of the Cairo. So just before this battle, Constantine claimed to have had a dream or a vision. We're not quite sure which one the histories disagree with this. This here is the record by Eusebius. Now Eusebius would like to have thought he was a mate of Constantine's. He, the way he writes, he's very chummy with Constantine, his mate. Um, and he apparently asked Constantine um, what happened that particular day. And it, he basically says that Constantine confirmed the statement by an oath who could hesitate to accredit the relation, especially since the testimony of after time has established its truth. Typically easy to read. A uh, real page turner, Eusebius says. But anyway, Constantine went on to say that about midday when the sun was beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun and bearing the inscription in Latin, obviously not in English, conquer by this. At the sight of this, he struck himself with amazement and his whole army also, who happened to be following him on the same expedition, lucky actually, and they witnessed the miracle. Whether that's the case or not is pretty much irrelevant because the rest of it we know to be factual. And that is what he did is he told his soldiers that they needed to paint the Cairo symbol on their shields. Now that is a chi and a rho. That's a two uh, uh, Latin or Greek symbols, if you like. The first two letters of the name of Christ. And it was believed to be a symbol, if you like, a motif or a flag of Jesus Christ. And so these men, the army, most of whom were pagan, not Christian, painted this Christian symbol on the front of their shields. And under this banner, they won the battle against Maxentius. Now, we shouldn't think to ourselves that what Constantine did here is a, a sort of instant conversion. He didn't. 
We actually know he didn't get baptized until about three hours before he died. So sort of left it to the last minute. Um, he doesn't seem to have been really Christian, but here's what he did do. He made a decision about religion, but not a religious decision. Constantine's story here was not a conversion, but an exchange of divine patronage. So what's happening here is that Constantine is trying to find a way to win an empire. He needs to get rid of Maxentius just to start with, let alone whatever else is going to follow after that. And he's trying to find a way to do that. And in his personal math, mental math, what he'd done is he'd, he'd gone through and he said, well, look, I've noticed that all of these people who follow multiplicity of gods, pagan gods, lose eventually. I don't know about people who follow one God because none of them have done it prior to now. So I'm going to give that a crack because that's different to everyone else. Um, I'm not going to repeat history. I'll do something different and see if I can win using that strategy. And so he decided to pick one God rather than a multiplicity of gods, more as, as this says, just trying a different divine patron. And he was strategically better on the day. He won, but this probably convinced him that that this divine patron was on his side. But importantly, Constantine did not choose Christ. In all of Constantine's speeches, he refers to God again and again and again, but he never, ever refers to Christ. And in fact, Eusebius comments on this, that, that he made this active choice. Constantine made an active choice that he believed in God, but he didn't talk about Christ. And Eusebius noticed it, noticed it who, who, was, who was a bishop. So very interesting decision-making here. So, of course, now uh, he wins this particular battle. He's got the Cairo on a shield. So that's that picture, not a, not a picture from the times, just in case you're wondering. Um, that This is a more recent recreation. Um, but it shows shields with Cairo on them. But... The reason we know that this story of the Cairo is not entirely made up is that coin. So that coin um, was produced within a couple of years of the defeat of Maxentius. And you can see it's a coin of Constantine's. In the middle of the coin is the Cairo. Very swiftly, we know from an archaeological standpoint, the Cairo was adopted by Constantine as a symbol of, of his own kingdom and, and where it was going. And so what happened after this, Maxentius is defeated uh, and Constantine is elevated, if you like, into the political heavens, almost as if he'd been birthed by the womb of Christianity. He is the first supportive of Christians emperor ever. And, and now not only is he declared to be an emperor, but he has defeated someone who the great Augustus in the East wanted to, to defeat, Maxentius. Okay, so then what happened is that uh, Galerius also resigns, um, and now there are two top dogs. They are Constantine in the West and Licinius in the East. And these two now become the top of the four. And they get together in 313 and declare what's called the, the Edict of Milan. And I'll read you some of that. This is, this is quoting from a guy called Lactantius, um, uh, who was also alive at the same time. Um, and these two top dog emperors say that when we, Constantine and Licinius, emperors had an interview in Milan and we conferred together, um, we decided that with respect to Christians, he says, we should give them their freedom. So in 313, the Christians are given freedom. Now, don't make a mistake. This was not making Christianity the state religion. That's another 70 years off yet. What this is doing is making Christianity legal. It had been an illicit religion. It's now a licit religion. It's legalized to be a Christian. So then having sort of got together with the two top dogs. They've decided that Christianity is allowable now. And of course, Constantine's on board with that because, well, this symbol helped them win a battle. Um, Licinius 
and, and Constantine, who had obviously been chummy enough to get together and have an interview at Milan, uh, decided they weren't quite so friendly. Um, I think Constantine decided that there was only room for one gunslinger in this town, and they went to war. And they went to war over a very long period of time. And the final battle was the Battle of Chrysopolis in 324, where finally Licinius in the east and Constantine in the west slug it out once and for all. And despite uh, Licinius having more men, Constantine wins. And now we've got rid of the Tetrarchy. Oh, but there's just one top dog left. It's Constantine. And he's the boss over the whole empire. Now, this is absolutely profound. I know some of that sounded boring and long-winded, but that's really, really important because this is one of the three great earthquakes in the Bible, in, in, in Revelation. So the rise of Constantine, the French Revolution, the return of Jesus Christ, great earth-changing events. And, and what it ushered in was a thing called the Constantinian shift. And the Constantinian shift was this massive shift in Christianity. Christianity becomes more of a state piece of apparatus. And we notice that, you know, the Catholics talk about diocises. I'm sure you've heard it. A diocese here and a diocese here. Um, and bishops are over a, a diocese. That is not a Christian concept. That's actually a concept that comes from the Roman legal system. The Romans would run their provinces under a diocesan system. And that was brought into the Catholic Church by Constantine. They adopted churches called basilicas. Now, a basilica, again, is not a Christian idea. It just happens to be the, uh, the, the, the place of legal representation in the Roman system. But it got pulled by Constantine into the Christian system. And so what happened is Christianity got Romanized from the time of Constantine. But more than that, Christianity start to, started to fragment. Um, there were the Donatists who headed out into Africa. What they, they came from, remember we talked about um, Diocletian. Well, Diocletian hated Christians. He did everything he could to kill them and to, to ruin their lives. And many bishops recanted their faith during the time of Diocletian. Well, the Donatists said, if you're a bishop and you recanted your faith, your faith is imperfect. You can't be a priest anymore. And all the other priests who sort of decided, you know, we're going to just go with the flow and then come back to Christianity after that decided that wasn't a great idea and they got Constantine on their side and the Donatists got chased out of the public square and into North Africa. There was a there was another belief called Arianism um, which is that well, a little bit close to us in some ways they believe that God the son was a created being not the creator being he was less than God so yes he was sort of godish but he wasn't the same as God. And that, that was, was a schism. There was Athanasianism, which talks about Homoousianism, which is all about God being of the very same substance as Jesus and vice versa. There were the Docetists. Jesus only looked human. He wasn't really. There were the Monophysites, um, which means Christ is one nature that is both human and divine. You can divide Christ down the middle and this half will be divine. And this half, well, that'll be man. And all of these different schisms started at this point in time and was slugged it out in the public square of Catholicism under the watchful eyes of Constantine. And if you got it wrong, you got booted out. You got exiled and you found yourself running away across the edges of the empire. And that happened in the years following the rise of Constantine. And this all trickled on until finally, there were a few bumps. There was a guy called... Uh, um, uh, I can't remember. There was one emperor who was pagan after this point in time, but from here on in, generally, they're all Christian. And finally, in the time of Theodosius, paganism was finally canned. He, he talks about these foolish madmen who believe in paganism, and you couldn't be a pagan after 380. All right. Long piece of history. Um, can ask if anyone's got questions, give you a long answer. Sure, yes, Chris. We're going through the same process again. Constantine was a politician, put his finger to the wind, Christianity was the flavor. Yeah. Today, the politicians are saying secularism and um, Marxism, all the other paganism. Yes. 
Christianity is on the nose and they're just in yes. the process of going. That's right. So, so Chris's point for those of you listening in was that uh, we go through a very similar process today where the politicians are, 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 are sensing the lie of the land as Constantine did, but now they're heading back towards Mar- Marxism, um, Marxism and socialism and, and you know, uh, paganism effectively um, and heading back the other way. So good point, Chris. All right. So here's the big question. Why is chapter 13 after chapter 12 other than you know, it's one number up. Um, well, remember, we read that verse. When they had finished their testimony, the beast rises from the bottomless. And now in chapter 12, verse 17, come across to 12, verse 17, we're going to read, and the woman was wroth with the, uh, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of his seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christ, and I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So what chapter 12 and 13 are all about is the development of the beast that we uh, uh, read about in chapter 11. That's why chapter 13 is here. That's why we've sort of done all this stuff with the witnesses, gone through this history, got to the French Revolution, actually got all the way to the kingdom, but now we fly back again. He says, okay, so you want to know more about the beast? I'm going to tell you about where that beast came from. And so what we're seeing tonight is the development of the beast system, step by incremental step. That's why this chapter's here. So let's get some of these symbols sorted. Who's the woman? Well, in the New Testament, the woman was the ecclesia, wasn't she? I've espoused you to one husband. You're, you're going to be um, the wife of Christ. You're going to be. You're not, um, you aren't yet, but you will be. Revelation 21, you're the lamb's wife. Now, the important thing with the passages is that the ecclesia was to be engaged to Jesus. We're not yet married to him. That happens in the kingdom. And that's very, very important because, well, uh, this woman is to be, the the ecclesia woman was to be a virgin, a bride, not a wife. But the woman here in verse 1 of chapter 12, she's pregnant. There's a problem, isn't there? She's been with someone and it's not Christ. And when we come to Revelation, there are two women in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, we've got Jezebel, that woman Jezebel. And then in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, we've got the 144,000, all of whom are virgins. So this woman here, she's kind of a mouth. She's the whole ecclesial body. She's... She's both the woman of faith and the woman losing her faith, all in one. And we can see that because here's a very interesting thing. In the chapter we're looking at tonight, the woman runs away into the wilderness. And she's going to be protected here. This is the anti-Catholic woman. Come all the way down to chapter 17 and there's a woman out there in the wilderness, but this one's riding a scarlet-coloured beast. You see, there's two parts to the woman. They both end up in a wilderness for different reasons and in different ways, but half of it is, well, it's it's a bit confused, this woman, and and that's why she's got herself pregnant. And we're told that she's going to have a child. Now, everybody knows that it takes roughly nine months to make a kid. Give or take. 270 days. And using our day for a year principle, that's 270 years. And have a look at this. This is really interesting. So in the book of Corinthians, we have a landmark moment in Acts because we're told that that while Paul was in Damascus, the King Aretas, the governor of King Aretas, sought to seize Paul. Now, that's a very, very useful thing for us. And this sounds like a massive tangent. It's not. Because you see... Aretas was a Nabataean king who reigned from about 80, 88, uh, sorry, 8 BC all the way through to 40 BC. 
This is actually, for those who have been there, the tomb of Aretas, or so it's believed, down there in Petra. Um, and Aretas did rule over Damascus very, very briefly for just one year. In fact, probably less than one year. He ruled over Damascus. And it just so happens that we can work out pretty much when he ruled over Damascus with E36, rough, pretty much spot on. We know it was 8036. That's that's the Nabataean kingdom. So we now know that the escape by Paul down the wall of Damascus occurred in 8036, which is very useful because it means, well, we know he'd been away in Arabia for three years before that, confirming his faith, which means Paul was converted around 8032-33, which is when the other early events and acts occur. So the reason we've done this is to say, look, when did the early events of Acts occur? 80, 32, 33. You could have said, I already know that. But all we've just done is we've locked it into historical facts. We've gone extra biblical to say, look, the Bible is trustworthy. We know when these events happened. And this is really important because you see, we said the gestation period of a child is nine months. Well, what happened at the beginning that corrupted the bad? Well, Brother Thomas suggests that the start of this is Ananias and Sapphira telling a lie, worship for filthy lucre, and the events of Simon the sorcerer. And this is the beginning of the corruption of the bride of Christ, which 270 years later, exactly at the Battle of Movian Bridge, in the birth of a man child, Constantine being elevated into the political heavens as the first Christian emperor. Isn't that amazing? Nine months, 270 years from the events of Ananias and Sapphira and the like, you come through exactly to the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And, and look, we're not the only people to think this. This is, this is not in any way a new idea. This is from Winston's essay on the Revelation of John 1794. He says exactly the same thing. 280 years that's how long it took from 80, he says 33 through to 8313, which is the Edict of Milan. And of course, we're told in verse two that this woman is travailing with pain. And there were birth pains because, well, in the, the, the sixth seal, there was this period of great suffering, the souls under the altar crying out, how long, how long? The moon turned to blood and the sun blocked from shining. The fifth and sixth seals were times of terrible suffering under the Diocletian persecution. And this rather charming looking gentleman is Diocletian, in case you were wondering. But we've got other symbols, haven't we? This woman is wearing a crown of stars, a, a diadem of stars, not a corona, a diadem of stars. Well, actually, she's not. She's wearing the Stephanos of stars. And that's important because elsewhere in Revelation, the word diadem shows up and that, that talks about a crown as, as due. You're right. The king wears his crown because he is the king. But Stephanos is something you win. So this woman is going to somehow win crown of 12 stars. 12 stars. Now, what's that about? Well, from John's vantage point, from where John stood, there had been 12 stars. There had been exactly 12 Caesars at the point at which John stood in AD 96. In fact, so much so that, that a book was written on that about it. More on that in a moment. But here we are. Here's the 12 Caesars. And by the way, it's so well known, this idea of the 12 Caesars, that you can actually buy a bracelet of the 12 Caesars. That is a 12 Caesars bracelet based on a famous book called The Twelve Caesars, written by a contemporary by the name of Suetonius. Suetonius Tranquillus wrote the book called The Twelve Caesars, and these Caesars were remote, responsible for transforming the Republic of Rome into an empire, making it imperial. So there were 12 Caesars, and so this woman, somehow she She's going to get the crown of the Caesars, of the imperial Caesars, no less. And at her head is the sun. We're told she's got 
She's clothed with the sun, as it were. And this picture here is another point of Constantine's um, stamp to celebrate another one of his victories. But what's really interesting here is this one proves the point that he hadn't actually converted to Christianity because standing behind him is the personified sun, but he's got the same face as Constantine. And Constantine was a real believer in what was called the cult of the soul invictus. All through his life, he believed that the sun and only the sun undefeated was his king and God. It says here that during the reign of Constantine the Great, the cult of, of the god soul invictus re uh, reached extraordinary heights. So his reign was spoken of as the sun impression. Isn't that weird? Here's this Christian empire coming to power, but he's dressed in the pagan robes of the sun god. And yet that's picked up here. She was going to be wearing the sun. And this has all got to happen at a certain point in time. We won't go into this in any detail, but the picture we're being given here is the picture of the woman once the throne in heaven has been vocated. She's got to get to heaven to have all of these pieces of clothing. Uh, and we'll talk about what heaven is in a minute. But in order to get these items of clothing, she has to get to heaven. So we'll be given the picture of the woman at a particular point in time. More on that soon. She's got the moon under her feet, representing an ecclesiastical system. In other words, she stands on the faith. She is founded or grounded on religion in some way. She's so there's an ecclesiastical symbol there. And then in verse three, we've got this other symbol in heaven. This one, a great red dragon. And we're told it's got seven heads and 10 horns. And we're not going to dive into it any great depth. We know because John tells us what those seven heads and 10 horns mean. The seven heads speak of seven mountains on which the woman sits. Easy peasy. It's the city of Rome, isn't it? The seven hills of the city. In fact, it tells us that we know that to be the case. And so what we're looking at here is a symbol of the pagan Roman power in all its malignancy. As characterized to begin with in Maxentius and later on Licinius. Ten horns should remind us of something else, shouldn't it? Ten toe kingdoms. And we're told again in Revelation 17 that the, the ten horns are ten kings which receive power with the beast. You know what that is too. So here's a system, an imperial system, but it's pagan, it's ugly, and it's based in Rome. And its tail draws the third part stars of heaven was that Maximinus got wiped out by Licinius. Now, we didn't go through this in any great detail. Another fantastic picture. Wouldn't you be pleased if they said, we've done your statue, this is yours. Yeah, boy, another guy who looked like he was bullied in primary school. Um, so Maximinus, one of the four Tetrarchs gets wiped out, but it's a third part of the stars of heaven. That doesn't work, does it? That would say one quarter of the stars of heaven. No, it's one third. And the reason is by the time Maximinus gets wiped out, Constantine is the only emperor in the West. So there are only three now. One third are going to go, just leaving two thirds of the stars remaining. And by the way, Constantine got this whole dragon symbol. This is again another one of his coins. You can see the Cairo at the top. That's the standard of the Roman armies. And what's it stabbed into? It's a dragon. It's a serpent there at the bottom. He understood. And just in case you think he didn't understand, have a look at this. This is from the Arch of Constantine. Um, uh, glorifying the battle at Mil Milvian Bridge. And one part of the army, what's it marching under? It's a serpent. It's a dragon. Oh, oh, and just in case we think maybe we made that up, this is what Constantine himself said. And now that freedom is restored and that dragon through the providence of God and of our instrumental 
instrumentality thrust out from the government of the empire. He said that when he was victorious over the pagan kingdoms to Eusebius. He got it. He understood what the dragon was, that it was the pagan Roman ki kingdom. And so what happens here is the dragon, uh, a pagan dragon, throws down one third of its stars. That's, that's Maximius getting wiped out. And then it's standing there waiting to take on this child as soon as it's born. The child is going to be Constantine. And, and Licinius in the East is waiting to wipe out, this is his ultimate plot, Constantine in the West. And Constantine is dragged up into the political heavens. That The word there caught up indicates by violence. And of course, it took violence to get Constantine into the political heavens. And once he gets there, he starts doing all of his stuff. But the ultimate outcome of that is that those who are anti-Catholic Christians, that is what's left of the woman after Constantine and his crew are gone, forced to run away into the edges of the empire. And that's what happens in verse six. They run away into the edges of the empire for 1,260 days, which is our time period, by the way. And then we read that there was war in heaven and Michael, that is the one who stands for God, in this story, Constantine and his... Agents across the empire, the angels, go up against the dragon. Well, who's the dragon? Well, the dragon is now Licinius. And, and that's exactly what we saw happen because to start with Licinius and Constantine are buddies, but at the end of this, Constantine and Licinius are going to go to war and they're going to fight both of them up there in the political heavens, both of them emperors fighting it out. And Licinius, the dragon, prevails not. Suddenly, there's no place left, in for, him, uh, left for him in, in, in heaven. And he's going to get cast out. And he's described as the old serpent. That language, the old serpent, the old dragon, is language that is used again in scripture of nations and kingdoms that resist God's will. And so Licinius... His power is diminished. Now, it didn't happen immediately. It's about 10 years of war between Constantine and Licinius. And so Michael, Constantine, defeats the dragon, Licinius, casts him out of heaven, but it's not the end of the dragon. And we read in verse 10 that there was a loud voice in heaven saying, now is salvation and strength and so on and so on and so on. And we say, oh, that's wonderful. The saints are happy. It's an answer to the prayers of believers. No, it's not. Because you see, we have to remember what heaven is in this particular story. In this particular passage, heaven has got a pregnant woman, a giant red dragon, and a war going on in it. It's not at all like the heaven we believe our God inhabits. And so the voice coming from heaven is, is the voice of those Catholic Christians who have now been elevated into the political heavens and that they're just so glad to have power for once in their lives that they rejoice and they see the elevation of Constantine and his kingdom as the fulfillment of the promises of the return of Jesus Christ. That's what that's talking about. And you'll notice in verse 11, they, that they felt that they had overcome the dragon by the blood of the lamb, the Cairo painted on the shields, and the word of their testimony, that's what the two witnesses were speaking, the testimony. But they were to find out that the witnesses were still required even after this point in time. And so we're told in verse 12 that woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. The devil, the dragon, is come down unto you. He's angry because he knows he has short time. And you see, what happened was this. 313, Licinius and Constantine are buddies. They get together and they make Christianity legal. But then Licinius decides, nah, I need to be the top dog. He goes to war with Constantine and he loses and he loses and he loses and he loses his way right across the empire. And we come to about 317 AD. Uh, 
and about 317 AD, and Lysidia says, I've had enough of this. I was with you on the Christianity thing. I'm now against it. And he revokes all of the freedoms for Christianity and, in fact, begins his own terrible persecution. That's what this passage here talks about. This is, again, you see this. He says, in the first place, Licinius drove from his house every Christian. He demanded that those Christians in the army be stripped of their ranks. He tore down their temples. And look what it says here. Thereupon the worshippers of God again had and the fields, deserts, forests, mountains again received the servants of Christ. It's almost like he had read Revelation 12 of the woman fleeing into the wilderness. And this happened in this period in verse 12, the short time demoted by Constantine from being the emperor under Constantine. And there was a period of time here between about 320 and 324 where poor old Licinius, he was still ruling, but he wasn't the top dog anymore. And he was angry and he put in place persecutions for the Christians. And he knew he had a short time. He made the most of it. And finally, he got beaten by Constantine in three successive battles ending at the Battle of Chrysopolis got forced into retirement, and then Constantine's retirement's good for you, and he had him hung. And then we've got something very interesting that happens, because verse 13, we're told that the dragon saw he was cast into the earth. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the child. So we've read about that. That's what Eusebius was talking about. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place to be nourished for time times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So what's the wings of the eagle? Well, every other translation just about says it's the wings of the eagle. And that eagle speaks of the Roman kingdom. Deuteronomy 28, Matthew 24, both of them tell us that it speaks of the Roman kingdom. And so what's been happening here is, is that the woman, what's left of them after Constantine and the buddies of Constantine have left the woman flee to the very edges of the Roman kingdom, the wings of the empire, as it were. So that's like the Donatists who end up in North Africa, various communities who go racing up and hide in places like Poland and Switzerland um, during this period to escape the persecutions of Licinius and eventually to escape the anti um uh, schismatic persecutions of Constantine and his cronies. And we're told she was there for time, times, and half a time, which is so 1,260 again. It's just the same period as we already read back there in verse 6. This is a repetition of verse 6. We're seeing the same events described again. But there is a question. If Licinius got whipped by Constantine in verse 12 and 13. Who's the dragon in verse 14, 15, 16, 17? Who's giving the anti-Catholic Christians difficulty for 1,260 years? Who's that? Surely the dragon died. Well, we were told the dragon had seven, seven heads, which represents seven hills, weren't we? And Constantine, having beaten Licinius, heads across and decides, you know what, the real centre of the empire needs to be elsewhere. And he sets up a city called Constantinople. And the amazing thing is, just a second row, it's got seven hills, famously got seven hills on which it is founded. And the symbol fits again. And you see Constantine now morphs from being Michael, the child of the woman, Christian servant, if you like. And he himself becomes increasingly dragon-like as he and his bishops hound out all of those who dissented against what was becoming core Catholic dogma, our brothers and sisters. We saw this in our last class. In the view of many historians, the Constantinian shift turned Christianity from a persecuted religion into a persecuting 
religion. And we're told in verse 15 that the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman trying to chase her away. I can't find the source for this yet. I have tried. I've seen it in several books, but none of them give me the source. But this is apparently written by a Donatist cleric in North Africa in the late 300s. And he writes saying, behold, suddenly the polluted flood of the uh, Marsarian persecution, that is the persecution of a bishop called Macarius, burst forth from the tyrannical church of King Constans. That's Constantine's son. And two beasts being sent to Africa from thence to wit, Macarius and Paulus, a most horrible and cruel ecclesiastical war was proclaimed that a Christian people should be compelled by the naked swords of soldiers, by the standards of serpents or dragons, and by the blasts of trumpets to unite with traditors. In other words, those who had de denied their faith under the rule of Diocletian. So that's an absolute whirlwind tour once again. But there's our time. 280 years of the gestation period of the corrupted church till it finally brings forth its firstborn son, Constantine the Great. It's a great earthquake. The whole world changes and the empire starts to shift very, very fast. But now, now what is left of the woman after the birth is no longer Catholic because Catholicism has gone with the child and it runs out into the wilderness. And we've got 1,260 years, time, times and half a time in which the woman is protected by the earth, which, as we said, we think is is one of those two witnesses the earth representing those state um, supportive rebels against Catholic state power. And that's our class for tonight. Any questions before I hand over? Or comments? One thing about the Catholics is that they have the Pope essentially that, that one person, they always take that. Yes. Because even all the other groups, even the Greek Orthodox and stuff, they still have a concept of ecclesiastical um, autonomy. Um, even the Southern Baptists in the, in the USA, they sort of run more like an ecclesial model. Yes. And that's a really unique thing to Caesar. It is. He's actually a Caesar. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, so you're right. So that centralization of power in one man really emerged with the Constantinian shift. Um, during the time of Constantine, and I think it's 324, there was the, uh, the, uh, the Council of Nicaea. And what Constantine did, this is so profound and so significant. Every major church in the world sees the, the Council of Nicaea as a really important moment. What happened is, there are all these warring doctrines, particularly Arius, who believed that God and Jesus weren't the same. They weren't the same power. Jesus was created. God was the creator. And then on the other side, there was Athanasius, who believed that God and Jesus were homoousis, the same stuff. And they were busy fighting it out in the church. And, and Constantine said, well, I've got to get this sorted. I'm trying to unify my empire. And you guys are busy dividing it again. What, what the dickens? So what, what he did is he got representatives of the church from all over the empire and brought them into town, sat them all down, and basically said, let's fight this out and get it sorted. Long story short, Arian got kicked out. But what was so significant is that Constantine sat in that council. And all of a sudden, the divide between church and state which when Christianity was illegal was inevitable. There was no talking between church and state unless it was at the point of a sword. Now the emperor is sitting in a meeting with the bishops and inevitably the bishops began to take on the emperor. 
Emperor's model until finally more and more power, they began to act like the Curians under the Roman system. And finally, bishops adopted power until we had one bishop above all, the Bishop of Rome. So yeah, you're exactly right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and when you look at this period, the number of wrong understandings about Christ and the ways you could slice and dice poor old Jesus. I mean, literally, there's the there's he's half and half, and then he's all and everything, and all and nothing, and he's he's kind of like God, but kind of not. He's got the name of God, but kind of. You know, there was just so many flavors that people were killing over it. The Donatists, who we've talked about a number of times, was supported by a group of people called the Circumcilians in North Africa. They went to war with the Roman legions over their faith. This was a real war in North Africa over belief, fundamentally, about whether a priest who has recanted his faith under persecution can still be a priest. That's what it was about. Amazing stuff. Lots of bloodshed. All right, thank you for your patience, anyone, uh, everyone. I'd be happy to talk later. So on your behalf, I'd like to thank Dan for a very informative evening, which much what's happened over the thousands or so years which have passed. And be living in that last era, where we all have to have a good understanding of who is actually our Lord and rightly dividing the word of God so that we understand also his mission. So uh, in regards to announcements, God willing, um, next class will be delivered to us by our brother Rene van der Muren and his title is Old Stories for a New Life. Wanted a salty people. So someone is trying to copy Dan with very interesting titles there. So we'll close with him and prayer. And we might have some, is there going, there's no supper I can see. Oh, well, then you just have to talk to each other without anything. That's okay. Um, so our closing hymn is hymn 186. <laughs> Yahweh, our God, our loving Father, we stand in our presence and the presence of thine only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has guided the nations over the last 2,000 years. In every age, he was able to extract out of the sea of nations those who would put their hearts and minds upon the salvation he wrought 
in his death and his resurrection. And in these latter days, we belong to those privileged ones. For we do feel privileged when we have just been seen the record of past ages of unspeakable hardship and cruelty, which yet is with us, around us, every day. And so as our children, we pray for thy son's return. We pray, Father, for having the right wisdom to guide our footsteps, to know of that great salvation personally, which thy son did wrought. And so we pray for always thy blessing upon our spiritual warfare, internal as well as that we fight that good warfare of faith as we bring that wonderful message which is so unique to those who we meet and those around us to keep our faith strong and vibrant. We also thank thee that we have a moment together as brethren and sisters to discuss those things which have kept us busy this week. Those things we have discovered, those things which have kept our feet light on the path. Which thou, thy son has trodden. So accept of our praise and thanks. In him 